Hi, I'm Jeremy Hawes with Arc Self-Defense. Um, recently, we've had some questions regarding self-defense and personal safety and security. And so we kind of broke it down into seven main points or seven secrets of the self-defense that everybody needs to know, but most people just kind of gloss over or even really neglect to spend the time to address and learn. Um, first and foremost, I've had people ask me, well, who are you or what makes you so special that you should be able to teach this or that you've got this knowledge? So real brief background on me. Uh, I started training in traditional martial arts when I was young, about eight years old, and have trained in that ever since. So I've got right at 30 years of traditional martial arts training. I've got 10 years as an active duty military veteran. I've served in combat theaters around the world. And currently I'm also a active full-time state certified law enforcement officer. So with a combination of all of that between the martial arts training, the military training, and then the dealing with criminals on a daily basis and the law enforcement training, I've got a pretty good base to pull from and can give you a pretty broad spectrum on what it takes to defend yourself and be able to do it safely and to be able to do it legally and still be effective when you do it. Uh, first thing we really need to look at is you've got the difference between a traditional martial art and a reality-based self-defense system. Traditional martial arts are great. That's what I began to learn initially, and it's still a lot of where I pull from when it comes to techniques and things that are going to be effective and ways to defend yourself. However, you can't get mired down in the traditional martial arts that's full of exactly what we talk about, tradition. It's full of tradition, it's full of customs and courtesies and cultural aspects that affect the way that's taught. And those cultural aspects and those customs and courtesies don't always equate to being able to survive on the street. The techniques do, but all of that other stuff can get in the way and it really fogs uh, a lot of instructors' abilities to teach that when they're teaching a short seminar or a two or three short class to somebody about what it takes to really be able to kind of save your skin on the street. They lose that focus and they get focused in on what they know, which is those cultural traditions. So when we talk about reality-based self-defense, that's exactly what it is. It's what's it going to take in the real world to be able to get out there, do what you have to do to survive and get home without all of the other stuff coming in. Not that it's bad, it's just a different curriculum and a different place for it. So when you are picking out and weighing things out, obviously you have to pick the right thing for you. If you're wanting self-defense, you want to survive and you want to be able to learn how to do it quick and be effective about it, definitely a reality-based self-defense, much like this ARCS self-defense program that we teach is what you need to be looking at. The ARCS program <clears throat> is the automatic reflex combat system. The idea being that we're going to take what your natural reflexes are, so a, a danger stimuli comes in, somebody throws something at me or a punch is thrown at me, I have a reflexed reaction that happens out of fear. It's that startle, the flinch reflex is what they refer to it as. So when somebody throws something at me, this happens because obviously I don't want to get hit in the face. It's a born into you natural trait that's developed over millions of years of evolution all the way back to a caveman standing on a rock and a pterodactyl comes in to grab him. That's what he does. He doesn't want to get snatched up. So the same thing happens to me when a bad guy throws a punch at me or uh, somebody throws a baseball at me. My head and shoulders move away. My hands come up to protect my face, the head and neck. So that's natural. So we use that as a bridge into basic gross motor skill movements because in times of high stress you lose your fine motor skills. But we maintain gross motor skills. That's why you can still punch, still swing your arm, still throw a kick, though it's not with exact precision and you're not able to do the very small things such as tie your shoe or button your shirt, you can still do those big movements. So that's the movements that we focus on to teach good self-defense. With all of that said, the first thing and the most important thing that comes into your reality-based self-defense programs such as ARCs is your mindset. If your mind isn't right, if you're not in the right place mentally and prepared to do whatever it takes you have to do to defend yourself, to get home and survive, then you can do all the training in the world and have hundreds and hundreds or thousands of techniques, but they're not really worth a darn because mentally you aren't ready to use them. So when that attack happens, you're caught by surprise and you go into that panic mode, you're going to do one of two things. Either you're going to shut down and accept the attack and hopefully you survive the attack, or you go into the survival mode and you'll fight back and do what you have to do to escape that situation. With the right preparation and thinking things through, planning ahead of time, and then having some confidence in the basic techniques, knowing that my reflexes will do the initial work and that I have a small series of techniques that I can repeat that are easily repeatable that you can pull out at a time of high stress because they don't require those fine motor skills. 
we can use them. So the ability to look around, be aware, know what's going on, and be prepared to deal with that is first and foremost. If you're not prepared to meet violence with violence, then you're not prepared for self-defense. A bad guy is going to be violent, and the only way to stop him is to meet him with equal or greater resistance to stop his attack so that you can escape. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very basic. So violence is a tool. It's not bad. We're taught for a long time. It's, it's a bad thing. It's not necessarily that it's bad. It can be used in a good way or a bad way. I can use violence as a cop to stop a shooting because if I in turn am more violent and put more rounds on target, I stop him. I neutralize that threat. So violence is a tool. So we need first get past that stigma that it's a bad thing and that in your mindset you can use it to save yourself. So that's number one is your proper mindset and then being prepared to do whatever it takes, whatever you must do to survive. So once we've established that, the next thing that comes from that mindset is mindset yields confidence. So the second secret, if you will, is confidence because with the proper mindset, you now have the confidence that you can take care of yourself in most situations and you're smart enough not to put yourself in unnecessary harm's way. So you're smart, you go out on the street, you can walk down the street with a little bit of confidence. Now you get your head on a swivel, you can be scanning, looking at things. That's the type of confidence where you can stand upright, you know you're capable of handling yourself in most situations. A attacker, a predator, wants to pick off a weak one. So a herd of animals running across the plains of Africa, the lions generally pick off the ones on the edges, the weak ones that can't keep up. So that's what a predator is going to do. He's going to look for the easiest target and somebody that's going to offer the least amount of resistance. And they do that through judging people on body language, if they're distracted, what they're doing at the time. So all those come into play. So that confidence yields you already a certain amount of protection because you send off a message to the predators, to the bad guys, that you're not going to be an easy target. So the second one, again, confidence. Out of that confidence, I already touched on number three, which is situational awareness. When the head's moving, the eyes are scanning, you're aware of your surroundings, you're aware of the situation that you're in or that you're about to get into. And if you can avoid a bad situation, if you can avoid getting yourself painted into a corner, you always have a much greater chance of one, avoiding the attack. If you can't avoid the attack, you can survive the attack because you're prepared with the proper mindset and you know where you're at, what's going on, and what tools you have at your disposal, be it uh, tools that you have on you for self-defense or just using your environment as a tool where you can put a barrier between you and the bad guy or you have another method of escape that's maybe not always viable to him. Moving on to number four is personal space. Again, just coming off that situational awareness. If I'm aware of what's going on, I'm aware of who's present, I also am going to be aware of my personal space. I've got a certain amount of a buffer zone, which usually is about your arm's reach or your wingspan around you that we keep in the, in the Western world. That's your, that's your kind of personal space. Anybody gets inside three feet of you is only because you're comfortable with them, they're a good friend, they're a family member, and you've developed a trust. A, just an acquaintance on the street, a stranger walks up, generally you don't let them get right up in your space because you don't know them, we're not comfortable with that. So it's okay to maintain that personal space. Somebody you're not comfortable with walks up to you and they're too close to you, put your hand up, take a step back, maintain your space, tell them, hey, hold on a second, who are you, what are you, and don't forget it is okay to not always be polite. I'm from the South, and everybody raised in the South taught you have to be sweet and polite and hospitable. And that's great to some extent. I'm not saying you need to be a jerk, but somebody comes to your door to sell a vacuum cleaner and you start to open the door to talk to them and you get that weird feeling down the pit of your stomach, something's not right. It's okay to slam the door. He'll go away upset, but you are safe. And at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what he thinks about you because he doesn't even know you. You don't know him, but you've avoided that situation. So from personal space being the fourth point, I've already touched on number five. Number five is listen to your gut, your instincts, that little voice way deep down inside you that tells you something isn't right here. Most people, especially if you talk to a victim of an attack, they will tell you, I knew something wasn't right. I got a bad feeling about this guy. I was talking to him, he just didn't seem quite right. And then boom, the attack happened. And so if they had listened to their gut, and then started to create more space, they would have been in a better position to get away 
or if it was a matter of I shouldn't have rolled down my car window because I just didn't feel right, but I wanted to be polite. And that's the thing, we have this thing about we want to trust people, we want to be polite, and I'm not saying that you can't, but you have to be very, very careful in that. And if there's any question whatsoever, I'd rather apologize later than not be alive to apologize later that I was slightly rude to this person because I didn't know them and I just had a bad feeling. So always better to err on the side of caution. And it kind of goes back to that old saying that you, know, you can always ask for forgiveness rather than permission. That's the situation I look at here. I can ask this guy for forgiveness later because I've survived it, I'm still alive, as opposed to just having to have been nice at the beginning and my niceness put me at a disadvantage. So it's just about being cautious and being careful. The sixth one is escaping the situation. So we're gonna use those basic, def the basic defensive techniques and I even use the word defense, I use it loosely because this is about self-survival so sometimes a good defense is a strong offense. So we're gonna fight this person off. We need to put them on their heels, put that bad guy on the run, which buys me time, buys me room to escape the situation. Uh, the idea being get away. Don't have to win, we don't have to have a knockout. It's not, uh, it's not a boxing ring and it's not a UFC match where there's a definite defined winner. In this case, the winner is defined by the fact that you were attacked, you managed to escape with minimal to no injury and survive that attack, survive that situation and go on to tomorrow. So the goal is to escape. And then seven, at, which is this fight to survive mentality, which we just talked about on escape. If I have to fight, if I find myself in a situation that I know I must escape because everything else has gone wrong and I'm dead in the face of this, of this attack, you do everything you have to do to survive. That's that mindset, using violence, using everything at your disposal to survive that attack. And again, we're not fighting to win. We're not looking for a, a knockout or a tap out or a submission. We are looking to do whatever you have to do to get away. And if that means, as I talked about before, poking somebody in the eye, slapping them on the ear, shoving them down and running away, and he gets up and he's fine, that's okay. You got a way to where you can make a phone call, call for help, lock yourself in a secure location, and do something to build a barrier and a, a zone of safety between you and that attacker, you and that danger. So we're fighting to survive, not fighting to win. Two completely different things. So again, to retouch them all is your mindset. If you got the right mindset, you're prepared to do whatever you must do. You're willing to take things to a level that the, the bad guy is not willing to follow you to to survive is the first thing, probably the most important thing. Mindset gives you confidence. So confidence being number two, I'm confident what goes on. It makes for a harder uh, victim. Bad guys want an easy victim. That's the point of picking a victim. So with that confidence comes the situational awareness. I'm aware of my surroundings. I know what's going on. It makes it again even tougher for him to select me as that victim because I already see what's happening. When I begin to see the situation unfold, I respond sooner. I've got more space. I've got more cushion. I've got more room to make that escape. After the situational awareness, point number four is your personal space. And that's being aware of your immediate personal space right around you, the space that a person can reach out and touch you in. So I always maintain that space. Remember, it's okay to be assertive in maintaining your space, especially with somebody you don't know or you're not comfortable with. Number five is listening to your intuition, listening to your gut. It is almost always right. There's a reason you have that. It's what keeps you alive. So never push yourself into a situation because it's something that you want to do or something you feel you need to do if that little voice is telling you, don't do this, listen to it, don't do it. You can, you can do it later, you can find a better way to do it, but at that point, step back, reassess the situation, listen to your gut. Six, escape the situation, get out of there, do whatever you have to do, like we talked about with mindset, any means necessary to get out of there to escape. The goal is to escape. And number seven we talked about is, after we've escaped, we've survived. So it is a fight to survive. If you must fight and you can't walk away, you can't escape, the escape comes from your ability to fight tooth and nail to the bitter, bloody end of this deal so that you can survive the situation. We're not looking for a win. A win is that you survived. So that's kind of the seven secrets of self-defense in a nutshell. 
And in that, when you do that, the reality-based self-defense programs are really what we're looking for. It's not the traditional martial art. Traditional martial art is great, but it's not the best tool for this. We pick a specialized tool for a specialized purpose. We're after a specific goal, and that's being able to quickly learn effective street self-defense. That's where our program, the ARC self-defense program, really excels because it's based on reflexes. So in a few minutes, I can teach you a couple of moves because you already do the moves and your reflexes of everybody are pretty much the same. You can't control them. So we really excel in that area. I believe it is what sets us apart from the rest.